It's a time in our service where we collect an offering. To those attending MCC Boston through our YouTube page, you too can participate by going to our website at mccboston.org and clicking on the donate button there for that purpose. Thank you for being a part of our church family. Members and friends of MCC Boston, for more than 51 years, this church has been welcoming the unwelcomed, embracing the unembraced, and advocating for the disadvantaged. And a wonderful thing happened while we were busy welcoming, embracing, and advocating for God's children. We became a church family. And much like the chosen family Jesus gathered 2,000 years ago, through our works, we grew in love and joy and in care of one another. Today, MCC Boston is still a loving and vibrant community of faith who emulates that what is written in 1 John 4, 7. Let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Through the years, I have been privileged to see people come into our church family and be forever touched by their experiences here. Many came to MCC Boston through our outreach, but just as many through an invitation by someone who is already part of this community. So this week, think of someone you know who still needs to hear the radical message of God's all-inclusive love and then invite them to our final Easter celebration service on March 31st. Our scripture reading tonight is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. The timeless story of the Good Samaritan. An expert of the law stood up to Jesus to the test and said, Teacher, what must I do to inherit everlasting life? Jesus answered, What is written in the law? How do you read it? The expert on the law replied, You must love the Most High God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, you have answered correctly. Do this and you'll live. But the expert of the law seeking self-justification pressed Jesus even further <coughs> by asking, and, ju and just who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, there was a traveler going down from Jerusalem to Jericho who fell prey to robbers. The traveler was beaten, beaten stripped, stripped naked and left half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. The priest saw the traveler lying beside the road, but passed on by on the other side. Otherwise, likewise, there was a Levite who came on the same way. And this one too saw the afflicted traveler and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was taking the same road also came upon the traveler and filled with compassion approached the traveler and dressed the wound, pouring oil and wine. Then the Samaritan put the wounded person on a donkey, went straight to an inn, and there took care of the injured person. The next day, the Samaritan took out two pieces of silver and gave them to the innkeeper with the request, look after this person, and if there is any further expense, I'll pay you on the way back. Which of these three, in your opinion, was the neighbor to the traveler who fell, uh, who fell ill with the, with the robbers. The answer came, the one who showed compassion. Jesus replied, then go and do the same. There are some stories which, when repeated often, grow in power, taking hold of the cultural imagination in a new way. And then there are others which, by their repetition, become tamed, their intent softened. Today's scripture falls into the latter category, though it is no stretch to say that the Good Samaritan is a widely known story. I am not certain that it is known well or deeply. Instead, I suggest that our cultural understanding of this most famous parable has been watered down. In daily colloquialisms, this parable is invoked rather broadly, rendering a good Samaritan no more than anyone who shows basic kindness every now and then. Stop to help a stranger with a flat tire. You are such a good Samaritan. Donated clothes you weren't using to a shelter. What a good Samaritan. 
took your leftovers with them and left them by a trash can in case a hungry person walks by. Why, you good Samaritan, you. In, in Googling the phrase, I found that one of the first results to come up was a definition with a sample sentence. He is such a good Samaritan. He used to go shopping for my gran when she was ill. Now, for the record, I have no objected, objections to assisting homebound seniors with their errands or donating clothes and food or helping strangers with their car troubles. These are all good things to do. I just think there is a bit of a gap between buying groceries for a sick friend and stopping on a dangerous road to personally clean the wounds of a naked man who is clinging to life, then throwing him onto your own beast of burden, walking him to an inn and paying for his care. Common interpretation tells us that the central question here, who is my neighbor, is not a sincere one. The lawyer means to ask, who isn't my neighbor? Or rather, whom don't I have to care for? When can I get out of the whole neighborly love thing? What he was almost certainly expecting to hear, if only because this is how most at the time would have answered the same question, is that a neighbor is a fellow Judean. He is required to help those like him, but not, none beyond those parameters. Which is often the way we too, on a cultural level, think about loving our neighbors. That it's about loving your own community and helping out those like you. And we all believe in that. Who doesn't love the guy who mows the lawn for the widow next door, or the woman who helps neighborhood children cross their street on the way to school? It's easy to love people who are our neighbors in proximity, whom we see every day and whose joys and struggles we know about. That's why the lawyer asked this question in the first place. He's looking for an easy way out. And he believes that Jesus is going to give that to him. But Jesus does not give the lawyer the easy way out. Jesus, in fact, takes the story far in the other direction by casting the hero as a Samaritan. Now, relations between Judeans and Samaritans were not exactly warm and friendly at the time. Shortly before this passage, in fact, Jesus' own disciples asked if God might be helpful enough to rain fire down upon Samaria which Jesus declines. So in casting a Samaritan as the hero of this parable, and a priest and a Levite and a, as an example of what not to do, Jesus takes a swing at those cultural boundaries which give the lawyer and other people of his time and ours a tidy excuse to ignore the needs of another. But I fear that our own cultural reading of this parable stays so broad that it enables many of us to likewise excuse ourselves from loving those who really need it, so long as we can consider them outsiders. If a person committing any good deed is a good Samaritan, this too makes it exceptionally easy for us to just buy some cookies at the bake sale and let ourselves off the hook. The actual aid the Samaritan gives is glossed over, so we forget that his actions were radical, above and beyond, that this story is meant to be hyperbolic. The Good Samaritan is meant to be someone who goes to unbelievable lengths to help another. He's supposed to sound a little crazy to us. But we've lost sight of that, and this parable has become no more than a nice heartwarming lesson about being kind Downplaying the radical nature of the Samaritan's caretaking, he becomes reduced to a sort of ancient Near Eastern Mr. Rogers. I can see him now walking through the desert in his sweater vest and tennis shoes. Hello there. Are you my neighbor? Can you say, help me? One of the features of this story, which enables such a glib reading, is the fact that we never actually see how the Samaritan feels about all this. We note that he is moved by compassion, but this doesn't really acknowledge how strenuous was the work the Samaritan did to help a stranger in need. So to review, the Samaritan encountered on a dangerous road fraught with robbers who clearly don't mind using force, a bleeding, naked man as close to death as to life. He stopped. He touched the wounds of this half-dead man attending to every single one of them with oil and wine. 
He shouldered this man's weight and lifted him onto his own animal so he could walk the man the rest of the way to an inn. Keep in mind, this is a bad part of town. By stopping to treat the man's wounds and then walking instead of riding the rest of the way, the Samaritan puts both, both puts himself in danger for longer and also makes the vulnerability of himself and his companion so highly visible that he may as well have had flashing lights and sirens announcing at-risk travelers who would be easy pickings for any group of robbers who might happen to be around. He then paid for this man's care, promising to make good on the debt, no matter how much it was, if what he had was not enough. This is not easy work. This is not donating your clothes. This is entering into the suffering of another person, risking your own safety and committing yourself to being with this hurt man until you are certain he can be safe. This is work. I've often discussed this parable in conversation with David Wojnarowicz's essay, Living Close to the Knives. Wojnarowicz writes in the late 80s about caring for his best friend and former lover, Peter Hujar, who has AIDS. He details the grueling task of taking Peter from hospital to hospital through a virtual sideshow of doctors with untried, ever more experimental treatments ranging from injections of tuberculosis to injections of human feces. Alongside dozens of other very sick men who are also desperate enough to try anything, anything to stop the pain, to give them a few more days, to maybe let them live long enough to see 30. His work is not easy. And one can sense in this essay how much it kills David to care for Peter, in the wake of a terminal disease which society ignores, seven years and tens of thousands of deaths after its discovery. Because there is always an excuse not to help. Much like the Samaritan, David remains by Peter through every step of this immense suffering, portraying it in great detail. He tells us, Peter can't walk without flailing his arms in windmill fashion to maintain balance. Peter can't handle the pain of being touched. Peter can't be in the same room as strong odors, and Peter is dying. Peter can't move his arms or legs without becoming nauseous. Peter is always in a bad mood. Peter's breathing is quick and shallow coming through in rapid-fire bursts like a machine gun. And Peter is dying. Peter is too weak to be carried the three feet to the bathroom. And Peter is trying every snake oil treatment and every last hope. And Peter is dying, and everyone keeps pretending not to see it. At one point, caring for Peter requires so much grace and patience and strength that David remarks, if he wasn't sick, I'd crack him in the teeth. But seeing the suffering moved by compassion, David remained strong by his friend's side, sparing his own inner turmoil. He never expresses his hurt to Peter until he gets to his graveside, at which point he writes, I tell him I'm scared and confused and I'm crying, and I tell him how much I love him and how much he means to me, and I tell him everything in my head all the contradictions, all fear, and all love, and all alone. This is the struggle required of David Wojnarowicz in caring for his best friend in the world. This is what it costs to show love. And throughout it all, Wojnarowicz understands that this is not only something that could happen to him, but it almost certainly will. Those were the times, and Sure enough, Wojnarowicz himself died of AIDS in July 1992. And if it is so taxing for David Wojnarowicz to show this love to the most, important per <laughs> the most important person in his life, how much more does it say about the Samaritan who stops in the road, risks his own safety, and cares for a stranger in need? How much greater is his commitment in providing this radical care to someone he has never met before? 
One can hardly blame the priest and the Levite for trying to avoid responsibility. Loving one's neighbor is taxing and complicated and so messy. It requires great emotional fortitude and at times a strong stomach. Many scholars point out that the priest and the Levite neglect to lend aid out of a fear of violating purity laws regarding dead bodies. And I don't think this is untrue. Though it was required of a priest encountering a dead body to bury it, one can almost understand why this priest might have faltered in the face of such great suffering and mortality. Perhaps he did not want to be reminded of his own mortality. Perhaps the encounter with such suffering is just too messy for him. Indeed, I think this is a part of why the priest and the Levite walk by, and the same reason all of us walk by sometimes. I don't think we're cruel, uncaring people, most of us at least. I think deep down there's a part of us that knows that the more we try to help someone, the closer we'll have to get to their pain. And the closer we get, the more that pain will become ours. To care for one who is suffering requires us to fully encounter that pain, to get close and care for each wound, as the Samaritan does with oil and wine. Such suffering can be overwhelming. Merely being near it can be far more than we can handle. That's why it's so easy for us to set limits around who counts as a neighbor. So easy that it's the best way to manipulate us. Tell us that those other people who live south of here are coming to our country to take money and jobs away from people like us. Tell us that those other people who live east of here are coming over and their culture is violent and having them here is a danger to people like us. Tell us that those other people whom we forcibly brought here are taking advantage of our charity so they can get by doing nothing by mooching off the work of people like us. It's so easy to play on the worst of humanity by just creating an enemy out of their neighbor. Just tell them that everything will be fine if they take care of each other and if they don't give their care to those other people. And part of that is because we are a scared people. And another part of that is just that we know there are limits to how much of the world's pain we can take on ourselves. And if we start taking that pain on, we don't know how far it'll take us. When someone we love hurts, we hurt with them. When a stranger suffers and we take the risk of walking closer, we risk suffering in empathy. The love asked of us is messy. But in the end, it is also salvific. It both breaks us down and gives us strength to rebuild. It is, in the end, the fuller life of which Jesus speaks. When the lawyer attempts to find a loophole in this commandment, Jesus says through this parable, there is no way out. If you want to love fully, you must love others, all others, no matter how other they may be. And this love will be risky and messy and require you to encounter their suffering which will become your suffering. And you must not only bend down and touch their wounds and not only stand by them, but care for them using every means you possess. And you must love when it is not easy. There is no loophole. There is no excuse. You cannot live fully without giving love to anyone who needs it and accepting that this love will require something of you. So I end this by saying to each of you, as Jesus says, go and do likewise. Show love, show perfect love, knowing that it will require more of you than you can learn from Mr. Rogers. Knowing that it will require you to act, to approach, to encounter, to care for, and to embrace the possibility that the suffering of others may become your suffering. And even if it doesn't, full life and perfect love cannot and will not come without asking anything of you. But if you want to live the good life Jesus offers, you'll figure out how to show that love anyway. Thank you.